Good morning, and welcome to Sunday School with Agape Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Reverend Troy Roland, and today we are going to be talking about Lydia called to serve. Lydia called to serve. Before we begin, let's start off with a word of prayer. Our most precious, loving, and heavenly Father, we call upon you this morning, Father, for you to impart some of your wisdom upon us, Lord, so that we may understand your word, Father, we may be able to deliver it to others. May we become, Father, the the vessels for you to pour your spirit into so we may be able to pour it out among others. It's in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. Lydia, called to serve. And as always, uh, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. And, <laughs> and of course, uh, hit the subscribe button so that way you don't miss any of them. Lydia, called to serve. Lydia, called to serve. I'm going to start reading with the in, start of reading the in focus, and the in focus says, William lounged on the couch by the window in the Saturday afternoon sun. His wife Betty was at her book club across town, and he had the house all to himself. So quiet, he thought happily. But as he listened more to the ticking of the clock in the kitchen, he grew restless. They had lived in this house for over 30 years, long enough to have three kids and see them go off to homes of their own. William and Betty were certainly enjoying the time to themselves, but now their empty nest just didn't feel right to him. He almost missed the little feet trapsing loudly upstairs or the chatting teens in the TV room. Dinners at the kitchen table were definitely less lively without the kids and their fiancés. It seemed to William like a waste of space. He wasn't ready to move to a smaller apartment. He wanted the guest rooms. He wanted to be hospitable. Over dinner, William talked with Betty about the feeling. You're right, dear, Betty said. Things are so different now without the kids. In fact, I was just thinking on my drive over there how far away my book club is. It used to make sense when Billy's baseball practice was out that way, but that was years ago. I was thinking, William said, how about we tell the church office about we're offering to host something here? Could be a new book club, maybe a small group. The question for the day is, how can you show God's love to others through hospitality? How can you show God's love to others through hospitality. Today we're going to jump around in a few books and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And, and there's, there's a couple of spaces in these and I'll try my best to explain what those spaces are. We're coming from the book of Acts in chapter 16. We're starting at verse 11. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verse 11. And the word of God says, We boarded a boat at Troas and sailed straight across to the island of Samothrace. The next day, we landed at Neapolis. From there, we reached Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. And we stayed there several days. I want to say that from Neapolis to uh, Philippi, it's about eight miles. Good, good hike. Good hike for today. <laughs> Verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a riverbank where... We thought people would be meeting for prayer, and we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. One of these women was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshipped God. As she listened to us, the Lord opened our heart, and she accepted what Paul was saying. I love this. Uh, Lydia was a woman that would have been well off during that time. Uh, the making of purple cloth was a rather involved process. Um, there was little snails that they used to get the dye out of, out of the ocean. And then uh, they would dye the cloth in it to turn it purple. And purple cloth was, since it was a, an, a long process, an involved process, it was a rather expensive cloth. So you only saw it on royalty and those of uh, upper stature. Uh, <laughs> I need to quit. Uh, th those are the people that you saw it on, those who purchased it. So it, it, it was fairly expensive. 
so here's this woman who worshiped God, but heard what Paul and Silas were saying, and 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 she believed in God all the more. Verse 15 says, she believed in it so much that this is what happens. Verse 15, she and her household were baptized. <laughs> I don't know about you, but here's a woman who hears the story of Jesus. And she is so taken by it that she's able to go back to her home and explain it to those in her household and they all get baptized. And it doesn't say that that's what happened, but I don't see any other way it could have happened. Yes, yeah, she worshiped God, but now she has a story of Jesus and she gets baptized and not only her, but her whole household. It didn't say anything about them going to her house with her. It just says, she and her household were baptized. So she had to have taken the word back to tell her household so that all of them believed and, be, and were baptized. Hmm. And yeah, that's power. Um, let's see. Verse 15, she and her household were baptized and she asked us to be her guests. If you agree that I am a true believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my home. And she urged us until we agreed. I like that she urged us until we agreed. She nagged us until we went to let me quit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She urged us until we agreed. She, she nagged us until we went. Um, six, one, a half dozen of another. Uh, let me stop. Okay. Now, here's where it jumps around a bit. We're going from verse 15. Remember, we're in Acts 16. We're going from verse 15 to verse 40. And the reason why we're going from verse 15 to verse 40 is because right after 15, there's something that happens. Uh, Paul and Silas are, uh, a, a woman is brought to them and it, it's, the woman is a slave. So the woman has this, this, this demon in her, this evil spirit in her. And uh, this evil spirit makes money for her owner. Uh, Paul and Silas run the demon off. <laughs> okay, so they run the demon off. And the guy that owns the slave realizes that he's not no longer going to make money off of her. So he's mad. He goes and tells the, the magistrate. And the magistrate puts Paul and Silas in jail. <laughs> because they basically destroyed his cash cow, so to speak. So now we're at the point where Paul and Silas is coming out of jail. Oh, there's a piece that I missed. Yeah. So while they are in jail during this time, uh, of course, they're singing and they're worshiping God. And there comes an earthquake while they're in the jail cells. And the jailer himself is so terrified that he actually intends to kill himself. But Paul and Silas doesn't let him. Um, he, because he thought that everybody would escape from their jail cells when the earthquake hit and everything was rattled and shaken and loose. But they were still there. And they told him to harm himself. Uh, <laughs> strange story. But the jailer himself becomes a follower because of them. Hmm. Okay. Now they're out of jail. And we get to verse 40. And verse 40 says, When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia, where they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left town. Now there's, there's a bit of a story right there. They went back to Lydia's house. No doubt that those who put Paul and Silas in prison were following them or watching out for what they were doing because they would love to have a chance to put them back in prison. But they go to Lydia's house and now Lydia becomes a marked woman, her and her whole household. Because now she's inviting them back into her house. It's awesome that she really just doesn't care what the authorities or whoever says. She just invites them back to her house because they were invited there to begin with. Huh? But it's a good thing because they stayed and encouraged the, those who were there. <laughs> now we're going to 1 Corinthians, verse chapter 1. 
But we're starting at verse 26 and we're going down to verse 30. I'm going to read through it the first time, then I'm going to come back and make some, make some uh, comments. 1 Corinthians 1, 26, it says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Verse 27. Instead, God chose the things of the world the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. 28. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Verse 29. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. Verse 30. God has united you with Jesus Christ for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Hmm. That should stand alone by itself. I'm just going to pull out the words here. Verse 26. Few of you are wise, powerful, or wealthy. When God called you. <laughs> Verse 27. God chose the things the world, the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. I like I like that verse just for the sole fact that it's it's God chose these things that are foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. Not that they're wise, mind you. This is they think they're wise. God has all wisdom. So if God tells you you think you're smart, <laughs> you ain't got a leg to stand on. Because you just think you're wise. And he chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. <laughs> it reminds me of, 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 of several things, these, these, these verses, verses 26 through 28 mean. It reminds me of several things. Reminds, one thing it reminds me of is, is the song, uh, and I wish I could remember who actually sang it, and I probably should have looked it up before I even recorded this video, but uh, it reminds me of the song, I'm Just a Nobody, trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save our souls. In that in that particular song, there's, there's an old beggar, an old man, and don't know if he's homeless or not, but they, they talk about him walking the streets, and him uh, him trying to tell people about Jesus. Here is the story of one of the weakest people that we would ever think of anywhere. And here he is telling everybody about Jesus. Today we would look at somebody, we would see them homeless, we would see them sitting on the side of the road and, 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 and asking for money or food. And we overlook them. And I'm reminded of, of, of a story, uh, La, La where it says, you should listen to the lame and ignorant too, for they also have that story. So here's someone that everybody looks down upon, everybody looks around, everybody looks over. And God is using him to tell everybody who would listen about the story of Jesus and how he can save souls. That's just a powerful song. <laughs> the other thing is God chose things despised by the world. Despised. You know, the world will never look at God 
and see him for who he is. We never look at Jesus and see him for who he is. The world says everybody needs to go right. And Christians keep going straight. The world says everybody needs to go left. And Christians keep going straight. Because see, if you're a true Christian, the world won't steer you in either direction. Because you're being led by Jesus. You're being led by the Holy Spirit. You're being led by God. So the world can't turn you in any other direction. I love that thought. <laughs> and the reason why God does all this is because those who are powerful are usually boastful. Those who are intelligent are usually boastful. So in verse 30, 29, verse 29, the, book, the word of God says, as a result, no one will ever boast in the presence of God. I think that statement there is also kind of twofold. It's telling us that no one will ever boast in the presence of God because the thing that God chose to be important will never be the same thing that the world chooses to be important. But it also says no one can ever boast. It means you can't boast in the presence of God. It's not possible. <laughs> One of two ways. Or both. You made that decision for yourselves. <laughs> God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit. God made him, Jesus, to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. We can't do it ourselves. We don't do it ourselves. There's not a preacher anywhere who's going to do it for you. There's not a religion anywhere that's going to do it for you. God does it. Jesus did it for us because he hung on the cross and died for our sins he did it we did nothing so keep that in your mind as you go throughout the day keep it in your mind that Jesus grows in your heart and then keep him in your heart listen to the Holy Spirit let him guide you not the world and regardless of how inept, how short you feel, how worthless you feel, or how much you don't think your little bit can help, help. Show people that Jesus is in you. Just do what he does. Do what Lydia did. Invite them into your home. Give them a chance. Give God a chance. Let us pray. Dear loving Father, we thank you for this lesson today, Father. We're asking you to remind us of the times that we can actually be useful, Father, to spread your word and your will. Remind us of the, of the days, Father, that we can tell somebody about who and what you are. Give us the strength, Father, to open our mouths in those days. In the words, Father, to speak in those times. We thank you for today's lesson, Father. And we invite you into our hearts and our souls to make sure that it stays with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful day. And of course, as always, if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. And uh, hit the subscribe button be with you next week. God bless you. God keep you.